Hey, this is Daniel Patterson from GrowYourMusicStudio.com, and I am here with Sam Reddy from Musee.live, and um, we're we're doing a, a sequel to the video that we made a couple weeks ago. So a couple weeks ago, Sam and I talked about online lessons, and as we were wrapping up that conversation, we thought, um, and a topic I think Sam that you mentioned a lot of folks are asking about in your community was on online group lessons. So we just kind of had an idea, hey, let's um, let's do a sequel and let's talk about that topic because I think it's a, of interest to a lot of folks. Uh, what do you think about that, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. That that is a pretty common uh, topic brought up in our by our users, our teachers. A lot of people want to see opportunities of expanding their studios and growing in different avenues and group lessons, of course, in person has always been a good avenue for that. So now a lot of people are wondering, well, what's the potential for this and taking it online? Yeah, so I think it could be a great, great conversation. And uh, I think the reason for the interest is just that I think to a lot, especially to single teacher studios or smaller multi-teacher studios, they really see online group lessons as the holy grail. It's the opportunity to have potentially a national or worldwide audience from which to draw students. You're doing group lessons and you're doing it online so you can be location independent. Um, and so I think the format of this conversation is going to be a little bit different because last time I had a ton of questions for Sam because he's kind of the expert on online lessons. Uh, but Sam suggested to me that maybe he put me through a battery of questions this time uh, simply because Grow Your Music Studio has for five years really um, been a proponent of group lessons and my successful group lessons method has been used by hundreds and hundreds of studios. And so I think Sam has a number of questions for me um, here in just a minute. But even before we get into that list of questions, Sam, there's there's a topic I think we gave a little bit of short shrift to last time. I think we can both weigh in on this and, and be helpful to folks, but that's equipment. That's actually a question that both of our communities um, asked about. So we asked for questions two to four weeks ago, got a number of questions from uh, folks in Sam's community, a number of questions from folks in our community. And the cons a consistent question I saw that, that, that came back was just advice and equipment. So Sam, I'm curious, do you have general advice for equipment or is there maybe one piece of equipment for online lessons? You're like, oh, this is the one that no one thinks about, but this is a must have. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, ironically for that last one, the, the must have that no one thinks about is a ring light. It has nothing to do with audio, has nothing to do with teaching. It's just, it's one of those things that if you don't have one, you'll, you won't notice it. But if I shut mine off, mm. pretty big difference, right? Yeah. So yeah. that that's my one little piece of equipment. Not total. It's not totally necessary or anything, but it's the one that when I got it, I was like, this is so much more useful than I ever imagined. Yes. Um, but honestly, I, um, I love it. I've been using a ring light for a year. I have two here right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really makes the, the picture look a lot better. Yeah, it, and it does help, especially, and it's sort of like a joke, but not really, because when you're teaching an instrument, it does help to have it lit nicely so the students mm -hmm. can clearly see what's going on. Um, we actually do have a page on our website that is musy.live slash gear, and it is our recommendations for this kind of stuff. Um, you've got your pretty typical, you know, you want to have a good camera. Most computers, fortunately, already do. Um, but of course, an external webcam can be nice not only is just a better camera, but a second camera, you know, having two cameras running at the same time, especially if you're playing a big instrument, like a piano is pretty much almost mandatory. So mm -hmm. having a webcam is pretty standard. An external microphone does help no matter how much audio processing and fancy algorithms and things that we do to process audio and make it better. It, that all helps, but a good microphone is going to be even more powerful right at the door. Do you have a recommendation? I have one, but I'm wondering what yours is, your favorite. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the staple, of course, is the Blue Yetis. But I actually, there's this one called Fifine, F-I-F-I-N-E. Um, it's only $35, super cheap, oh, wow. super low key, just a USB microphone plugged right to your computer. Hmm. Really good quality, really easy to use. No plugins, no downloads, nothing. Just plug it in and it works. Interesting. Um, it's only 35 bucks where, you know, the blue Yetis are great, but you're yeah. talking 135 bucks for that. I use uh, the blue snowball. Nice, right? Yeah, the yeah. snowball. And it's a good one as well. I have had this for 
seven, eight years. I can't remember what it cost, but right? I know it yeah. was under a hundred dollars. Yeah, and those are all great. There's a really They're cool good. one too that Audio Technica makes. Yes. That it's both a USB microphone and an XLR microphone. So I'm a big fan of that one because you could obviously you can use it in your studio setup for traditional recording use cases. But then if you want a really quick, easy USB microphone, you just plug it into your laptop. So that kind of stuff is useful. One of the other things that I suggest people um, try out or if they're interested is uh, digital writing pads. So digital writing pads are basically like a plastic pencil and a small square surface. They plug into your computer USB, no software or anything, but it takes over control of your mouse. So if you want to write on a whiteboard or annotate a document or something, you can use these pencils to just write as if you're writing normally and it will transmit it to the screen. And there's a company called XP Pen. They make one hmm. for $20, $25, um, which is really good. And I use that in my whiteboard all the time. So if I'm trying to annotate something, instead of using my mouse to like terribly draw, I just use my pen and actually draw as if I'm normally drawing. So things like that, I think are super helpful. Um, and then of course you could go crazy with audio interfaces. You know, if you wanted to do the whole microphone audio interface and all your gear wired through there, that's right. great. Too, but that's a little bit more involved. So that's not really, um, you know, that's not really the baseline. That's sort of taking it up to another level. Yes. Yeah. No, that's great. I think the only thing I would add to that, you mentioned you had a gear page on the Musi site. Um, we just added a little bit because I think at this point, there's a lot of people out there um coaches and tim topham and us and I, I think everyone at this point has like their favorite gear type sure. thing we never we never published that we actually published um not too long after uh you know what happened last year happened i don't like to say it because sometimes right. <laughs> on youtube it gets suppressed if you use certain words but this incident sure. that's affected all of our lives <laughs> in the last 18 months um not long after that, we published actually a roundup post of 20 or so different blogs or videos made by, you know, people in our industry who, you oh, know, cool. Joy Morin, Tim Toppa, that sort of thing. Um, and, and some of that included like gear to buy. And even in our successful group lessons training, we have, we, we added a whole section about how to do online group lessons in that training. Oh, um, and one of the things that we put in there um, was kind of a community roundup from the 300 or so alumni we have in that training of that training of the the various gear and things that they bought but i think the number one thing that i saw people getting that i thought was a little bit unusual um that would differentiate from regular online lessons so a differentiation from online just traditional online lessons to online group lessons was some teachers bought multiple tablets mm -hmm. so that they could have one um tablet per child in their online group lesson <laughs> and uh so that they weren't having to bounce between breakout rooms and things of that nature and um you know those teachers uh, really enjoyed that because they they felt that they weren't having to interface with the technology so much it was really just about uh you know being able to see that child on that particular screen so right. i thought that was kind of cool it's like um, almost those little robot carts that move around with like the ipad yeah. and Face. Got yes. a full of those instead <laughs> yes there was um there's a show on nbc called community and they actually had an episode where they did that um now that's <laughs> but, been like six years ago but right? i know that, exactly perfect, what you're talking though. about <laughs> yeah it really would be <laughs> um cool well so i think i think that's a good place to end kind of the 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 um equipment discussion so now i'm on the hot seat so i think yeah. I think you have a battery of questions you wanted to ask me, so I'm more than happy to go there with you. Um, awesome. So uh, what would the first question be? Uh, yeah. Just various questions that people had about online group lessons. Yep, so yeah, let's just jump on. Uh, this one I'm sure you've had a billion times, but it's quite useful is how do you price your group lessons? Is it any okay. different than your normal one-on-one? -on -one? The rule of thumb that I give to people, whether it's online or in person is it, it, well, first off, let me actually back up from there, because before I can give the, the principle, I kind of have to define some terms. Hmm. My recommendation for folks who are doing group lessons is to do an hour 
at least. We actually oh. have alumni who do 75 minutes or even 90 minute lessons. Oh, interesting. Um, but my standard advice is go an hour. And some people have said, is that too much for a young child? Um, but I had five-year-olds that would come and stay with me for an hour. Now, I would ha handle them differently than I would a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. I would do different things in the lesson with them than I would with a nine-year-old to kind of keep them engaged and keep them moving from activity to activity. But, but in general, one hour, perfectly fine, didn't have issues with it. Mm -hmm. With that as the context, what I'd say is, how did I price group classes? What what I started doing way back in 2008 was I would put four kids in a group class and I would charge for the one hour the same amount that I charged for a traditional half hour lesson. So okay. what I did was I just kept charging people the same amount that I was charging before for their half hour lesson. And now mm -hmm. they're coming for an hour. Mm -hmm. and. Because of how I had the group lesson set up, uh, those kids were getting better, quote unquote, you know, better results than they were with me one on one. And part of the reason for that was because they were there with me longer. Right. <laughs> so if parent, if I ever got any pushback from parents, I would kind of point to the fact that they were retaining what they learned better. They mm -hmm. were covering more pages each week. They were passing more songs each week. And overall, their confidence around their skill was higher than it was in one-on-one -on -one lessons. And right. that has a lot to do with, with how I structured the classes and what the content was, but I don't think we're really gonna get into that in sure. this Q and A. In fact, you know, there was a whole group of questions that people asked that um, I don't even think I'm gonna answer on this call. I was kind of looking over the list of some of the questions that we looked over before we started this. People ask, how do you structure the group lessons? Um, how do you get started with group teaching? How do you convince parents to try or switch to group lessons? How should students be grouped together? Um, I have a lot of opinions on that. And I've actually created a lot of resources and, and videos around that. So I'm actually going to, I don't know, in the comments or on the video blog post or however we publish this on YouTube, wherever. I'll, I'll make sure there's a link there. Um, to a free resource I have that answers a lot of what I consider to be more basic questions. Um, even a couple months ago, I did I did an entire video on how I did multi-level group lessons. So I actually didn't group my kids together by level. I would have a beginner and a third year student in the same group and they were both having their own individual experience. And so some of those more basic questions that got asked, I'm gonna kind of point to resources that I have created in the past that are much more in depth. Um, as opposed to kind of answering them again here, but wherever you're watching this, it'll probably be in the comments somewhere or on the post or something like that. But um, I thought I would at least deal with some of those questions I think we're not going to cover. But, I, you know, I know that's a little far afield from the original question that was asked, which was how do you price group classes, but I kind of wanted to address that because the pricing was even based on how I structured it. So. Right. <laughs> to some degree, I kind of have to get into that to explain to explain why. So I, I hope that's a good answer. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And you actually sort of already alluded to the next question a little bit. Of Interesting. How young would you go with your groups? And you mentioned you had five year olds. And yeah, is that the limit or would you is there no limit? Yeah, let me let me kind of address that because there's some nuance there. And that is when I first started out doing this back in 2008. I I had I felt six year olds were a handful, mm. even seven year olds, but it really had to do with my skill in teaching the group. Sure. So, and irrespective of whether you're online or in person, yeah. Um, I think that the younger the child, the more energy it's going to take from the teacher. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, people starting out who learn from us how we do group lessons in our SGL method, um, we'll we'll say to them you know, keep your groups to three or four and maybe have a cutoff at, at six or seven just to make it easy on yourself at the beginning. And then over time, as you gain skill and you get better at kind of handling the demands of a multi-level group, then maybe consider increasing the size. And so what I'll say is that when I closed shop on my studio a couple of years ago to focus on this full time, uh, I was seeing five kids at a time as young as four and there's got to be a better way to say this, but I, 
it didn't feel like a challenge anymore. Mm, yeah. I the kids were getting such results that that for a lot of the kids I really felt like they that I wound them up really well in their foundational material and like the first three, six, nine months they were with me. And that they were kind of these self uh powered music learning machines. <laughs> and and so it, you could have. <laughs> yeah. And and so it it didn't take a lot of energy. I didn't, you know, some people they hear five kids at a time, you must be swinging from the chandeliers. But mm-hmm. a lot of time, I mean, I have video observations. Sometimes I would record the group class to show other to train other teachers how to do it the way I did. I would record a group class. And, you know, th- one of the comments I would frequently get back was I was surprised at how calm the environment was. And I was surprised that a lot of times I just saw you standing in the middle of the room, kind of looking over the shoulder of the kids, monitoring them, but not having to do or say a lot. Now, how does that translate to online group? Well, Mm -hmm. instead of being there with the children, now I'm there with the iPad. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, And and so the, the only, to me, the, the biggest challenge that most business owners have is the six inches between the, the ears. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's the thinking and, and it's the assumption that there has to be all that things have to be so different. Mm. Um, I think I've even heard you allude to this, that, yeah. that, um, you know, pe- people tend to overthink things. And for me, especially as a male teacher, it wasn't that big of a change in that I had kind of a, a rule for myself that I really wasn't going to make physical contact with a child. Now, right. one of my teachers um, was an old school uh, teacher who had been trained in kind of the Russian format. And when <laughs> I was working with her, she was 75 years old and she would literally like smack my arms <laughs> and stuff so like that. You might um, not be able to get away with it. I anymore. would <laughs> never do that now. You know, so, <laughs> So for some teachers who are comfortable with that, with physical contact with the child, then, you know, it could be seen as a hindrance, but I had gotten very used to affecting what a child did physically by only using my words. Mm -hmm. So that was a skill that kind of preexisted in me prior to, to, for the necessity of going online with the group lessons. Um, And so, you know, if I'm interacting with the child and I'm standing right next to them, or interacting with them and you know they're through a screen and they're several miles away in their own home to me there there wasn't a lot of, of difference especially right. as kids got used to the online environment you know which mm-hmm. i think that's a, a, a we're kind of in a different place now so anyway again once again i gave a lot of context there but how young would i go um maybe a final answer to that would be if, if a child was under six four or five I would have an interview with the, the student first. And if I felt like they could handle the group, then I would let them in. I will okay. say that it was a special, fi- for boys, it was a special five-year-old that could handle it. But sure. I took five-year-old girls all the time because they had the attention span, whereas the boys didn't. Sure, that's fair. That's yeah. understandable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that one. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that, that's great. That's I, th- I think that's super helpful because that's a big thing I think people get stuck on when they're trying to get started is that like, well, where do I actually begin? Is this is this going to be kids classes? Is this going to be adult classes? Is this going to be something mixed and mashed? You know, so I think that's a great sort of benchmark for people to work off of. Um, mm. Yeah. And then um, uh, and this so this next one, this is a, a one I've dealt with a lot recently or just in the last couple of years, but uh, I'm sure you've got a lot to say about this, but is, is how do you deal with the parents who think that the online classes aren't worth the same money as the in-person classes, that mm. there's somehow less value there? Um, yeah. Do you deal with that at all yourself? Or Okay. This has been a big one. As you mentioned, you said you've been hearing this a yeah. lot lately. And when, uh, when the current you know, crisis started last year, there we are we had something like 30 people enrolled in our master class marketing program Mm -hmm. and a question i started getting in all of our our live q a's that we do weekly Mm -hmm. was this exact question and i do think things have changed i think there was the initial panic and now i think that 
Uh, oh, sorry about that. Let me turn that down or I'm going to uh, probably get <laughs> no 86 notifications. Right. <laughs> um, I do think that, that things have changed, but this is, a, this is something that still persists. Mm -hmm. If the parent is saying this, I think the problem that most teachers have, again, it's the six inches between the ears, is that if they haven't prepared off the spot for this question, then you're leaving up to chance whatever random neurons are firing in the <laughs> moment to answer this question. But a good I think also that if you engage with the question, it subtly signals to the parent that the premise that they have snuck in has is true and the premise mm. that that parent has snuck in is that it actually isn't worth as much as in-person lessons okay now i'm a real big fan of old school law and order i'm talking like 1990s law and order and you know right. um uh the you know the the judges are always saying you know you know um you know Jack McCoy is always trying to get away with sneaking stuff in. Facts, not in evidence, you know? Sure. <laughs> Watch yourself, McCoy, you know? All right, I'm being a little nerdy here. But uh, maybe some people are as big a fan as I am of, of reruns of a 30-year-old show. <laughs> um, but uh, the, if you give in on the premise, then you, you've already actually subtly signaled to them that you, that – you've lost the argument and now you're just in the defensive. So the, right. I think the, the killer phrase to use for that question um, is literally to ask the parent, oh, why do you think that? Mm, interesting. Yeah, and put just the value shut back. up. Don't yeah. say anything. And it isn't like, oh, we're trying to have a gotcha moment. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like we're, we're trying to trap them. The only way I know how to to solve this problem is to actually hear what the parent says. Right. And this is actually what I did. Uh, one of the questions that was asked that I said, you know, we have other resources about this was how do you convince parents to try or switch to group lessons? Mm. Well, the reason I came up with what I call my four magic messages um, that that uh, that that I've used to help parents see the value of of just group lessons in general was I made every mistake in the book in trying to convince <laughs> parents that group lessons were just as valuable. And what I learned over time was that if I could get in front of them, be like three chess moves ahead and mm -hmm. seed their thoughts with something else, that the questions then didn't even come up. And the same thing is true of the online group lessons. So you have to ask them that question, listen very carefully to what they have to say. And a lot of and a lot of times you will catch in in their response to you, you will catch the lie or mm -hmm. the half truth or the fear that that is causing them to ask that question. But not knowing what a parent is going to say to you know hundreds or thousands of people that will watch this video, I would say that if you can point to progress as a measure that things are just as good as they would be in person, then of course it's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think each teacher kind of has to come up also on their own, like how do you even measure value in your studio? Sure. I, I think you have to ask this conversation with yourself. The truth of the matter is, is that 95% of business owners don't or, or studio owners, but I would say even business sure. owners too, aren't even sure how yeah. to defend their product against objections. Um, right. <laughs> but I think just getting that information from the parent and then off the spot, thoughtfully thinking about what the parent said and and beginning to understand logically, oh, well, that that's just kind of irrational. That's just an irrational fear. Now, of course, you can't say that. But what you can right. then do is start to find that message that inoculates um, your product against their fear. Yeah, it's actually yeah. similar. Like last time we talked, we had... Um... Uh, a similar kind of situation around like should kids spend more time on their computer yeah. right it's sort of like the, the question the, the worry is misplaced almost um, it's not that they're actually worried about kids being on the computer longer in the day they're worried about like the effectiveness and the the actual outcome of the quality of the lesson right so that's mm. so like if teachers are if parents are asking 
is this even the same quality? Why, you know, is it the same quality? Is it the same price? Seems to be what they care about, right? Are they yes. getting the same value for their money? And like you say, if you can prove that actionable, you know, with data that your students are actually progressing or that, that this problem actually isn't really the problem they think it is. Yeah, I think mm. you made it last time you said something like showing, uh, it was a good line. It was like something like showing them the, the, like the lie they're telling themselves or something yes. like that. Yeah. Um, and that I think applies here too, is like sort of getting them to sort of become aware that the question doesn't actually make that much sense in itself. Yes. Yeah. Um, one teacher even wrote in that one, uh, that a parent had brought up to them that they saw on the news. And she said, she's mm. heard this more than once, uh, that kids can't learn online was, right. was something that several parents in this particular teacher's studio referenced, like a, maybe they all watch the same news program right, or something. Yeah, some article or something. Um, and, and then now they're repeating, parents are repeating that to teachers. So again, I think in a panic, you can, ass- oh, well, now I have to defend this. The world is conspiring against me. Now I have to defend this. But again, if you jump to that and just assume what they're saying, it's true then you've lost. You have to show leadership. And I think, again, the way to show leadership is to humbly ask questions. And the thing that I would say to that, not in a panic, would be, oh, interesting. Did did they say that kids can't learn music online or or was it something else? And you just begin to put that seed of doubt into the parent's (laughs) mind. Um, And more importantly than even just that question, is the, it's the leadership that you're exhibiting. It, it's the non-anxious presence that you're having, which they will more than likely make the decision based on how you're presenting yourself or being than if you have like a data-backed response, you know, and, yeah. and a, a double-blind study that you can point to that, oh, you absolutely can. But you said a word there uh, maybe a couple minutes ago that I think would be a good way to end this question, and that is proof. Hmm. And you had even mentioned um, off in a conversation that we had off camera about um, um, uh, unique things that teachers are doing. I don't want to steal your thunder because I think we have a question coming up where you're going to reference this, but unique things that teachers are doing to build community in their studio. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's around like performances and some teachers even splicing multiple kids together, things of that nature. Um, you can point to video evidence like, oh, hey, all these kids are seeming to be doing just fine. <laughs> you know? um, but, it, you know, if, if you keep running into the same objection over and over again, and all, and I'm not saying that anyone here who's watching this has done this, surely not. But if you keep running into the same objection all the time, and all you do is complain about it and not find a way to inoculate against it, then, you know, you're just in for a long battle. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things I did with group lessons was try to find a way to, to demonstrate to parents proof, you know. Um, you can't get much better than video proof. And, right. <laughs> you know, we all have these things now. There's absolutely no reason yeah. why you can't uh, shoot 1080p video of students... Yeah. <laughs> Um, doing really, really well. Now, of course, I know Zoom doesn't have the capability to do 1080p, and I know Musi's video quality is probably better, but um, but uh, I, I, I do think that um, I, I do think that being able to point towards specific case studies in your studio is going to be really, really helpful. Yeah, that, and that I think you know. is important. What you just said, the, the the differentiator was case studies in your studio. Yeah. Not just case studies, like we were saying a second ago, not just some double blind study that proves online learning works, but actually showing kids that you've worked with that have actually progressed, kind of like a body tr- fitness trainer. You know, when mm. if you don't see any photos of like client progress on their yeah. website, then you're probably, you're like, okay, well, I, I, I can't trust this guy actually knows what he's doing. So uh, I see music is exactly the same. You'd want to have an example of a kid early on in their lessons and then an example for that same kid further down the line and showing how they're actually progressing. Um, Mm. I think that kind of outfacing stuff is super important. It just in general. Um, Yeah. 
And, and yeah. I think it just shows proactivity. And I think this is where maybe I'll ask you a question because I, I was touching on it, but there, and there were some comments that you made in the conversation we had separately that were really interesting to me. Um, but I think it leans into this because more than just being defensive, how do we exhibit value? How do we demonstrate value to a family that might be inquiring or a current family who we're trying to get to go into online group lessons or in, into online lessons in general? Um, and a question that came up in some of the questions that were sent into us was, um, how do you foster community with online group classes? Um, mm -hmm. And I know with you kind of being the online lesson expert, and just from what I know about teaching, you know, group and online group, um, there, there isn't really a big differentiator in how um, one would foster that community in the studio, even though there it's, it's not in person. So I'm curious what thoughts you have around yeah. fostering community in, in online lessons or online group lessons. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, yeah, I, I think that like we kind of alluded to earlier in this conversation is the, the overthinking part comes into play a lot here is as if you need to do something different because you're online where mm. I'd argue you don't really need to do much that's different. It might be physically, you know, slight variation, but the, the general concepts I think are all the same. Like uh, you can have a group or online or online group or whatever online classes, but you can also do an online recital so that all your students feel like they're actually working towards a goal. And I'm with Musi and there's other you know ways to do it, but you can literally get all of your students into the same virtual room together. And you can have, you know, like round robin where everyone kind of goes up on center screen, performs their piece, and then, you know, cycle through the whole studio. So all mm. the parents get to watch, the families get to interact, people get to practice performing in front of other people. And honestly, being online can actually kind of alleviate the, the stress of having to perform in front of people for the first times. Mm. So a group like a, a recital online could be great. I, and something you sort of mentioned earlier was one of the things I've seen teachers doing is doing like round inside the class, doing like a round robin where the teacher might record something and then have every other kid go around and like play along with it or record along with it and then splice that all together cool. into a recording. So there's, it's all the same things that you would be doing in a normal class. Um, games and interactive activities and things like that you know if you're using like an interactive whiteboard all of the kids can play the games together at the same time so they're still talking to each other they're still you know communicating with each other and uh you can do you know, we do instead of breakout rooms we break out audio same concept but they don't actually leave the single room but hmm. the idea is that you could like pair kids up together to work by themselves or you could be talking just to one person at a time but it's all the same methodologies that you'd be teaching, same concepts as my in-person normal classes. I just transfer the, the concept to an online format. But that's yeah. sort of what I think a yeah. lot of teachers are, are missing is the concept can stay the same. The execution might be slightly different, but the overall value is going to be equal. Like we have some teachers who do hybrid lessons that are mm. groups. So they'll have three or four kids on the on the TV and then three or four kids in the classroom. Cool. And what they, so they do things like they have this giant board. It's like a giant piano, uh, like a whiteboard. There's like a physical thing. And the kids all have these like big magnets basically. And they can put them on different spaces on the piano and they can move them around. It's like very hands-on. So the kids in the classroom get the physical version. The kids online get the whiteboard version. Nice. It's the same stuff. Nice. Right. So they're still moving their icon. They're still moving the thing, still playing the same game. And they're all playing the same game together. They're just using two different game boards. One's physical, one's digital. Yeah. And so that way, the kids actually are all communicating and playing together the whole lesson, even though three of them are hundreds or thousands of miles. Yeah. And, That's cool. and potentially never even met some of the other kids, you know? Um, so I think it's very doable. It's just don't don't overthink it is, yeah. is really the yeah the now i think i'm gonna add one all that's fantastic um and i don't i'm only gonna add one thought because again the topic of the video is we have tended to kind of j jump back and forth between general advice for online lessons but right 
and online group lessons. But here's one specifically for online group lessons. And this is so, so dumb. But I think it plays right into what you're talking about with overthinking things. For years... Actually, no, I have to back up before I end that. All right. So I have I have a confession to make. There are music teacher and music studio bloggers and businesses out there that are about creativity and games and activities and arts and crafts for music. I unfortunately have never been that person. And it's not because I didn't want to be. Uh, it, it just I don't think I have that bone in my body. Oh yeah. <laughs> Perfect example. You know, I was on Joy Moore. Joy, I love Joy Moore and she's great. She's a good friend. Um, I was on her blog and she had these music sticky notes. Mm. And I bought her her um her music sticky notes uh template and I printed them out and I felt so weird putting them at my CEO because it really was out of character for me because it, it sure it, that's it, like not part of you yeah it looked it looked nice <laughs> right <laughs> which, which isn't I'm, I'm not a branding guy I'm not like a I'm not that guy yeah I, the grow your music studio blog was basically the default WordPress theme theme for three years <laughs> you know, right. like I had to hire an outside agency to make the look for the you know for the business <laughs> that's fair. so I'm not that guy the point I'm getting at is that I was never that guy that that teacher that could come up with all these amazing activities for things for kids to do. But I invented something called music hangman. And the rules really simple In normal hangman, you have a word. And if you guess a letter wrong, you get a, you know, you yeah, like, get a body part, you know, yeah. the head or the body, the stick body or the stick arms again. <laughs> um, and I, I altered it just slightly. I don't even know. I think my, my um, partner in the Piano Express, Greg, I think he and I came up with this together, honestly, in 2005. Um, but instead of you getting a body part for getting the letter wrong, you'd, I would have music flashcards. And hmm. if they got the flashcard wrong, they would get the body part. And so nice. it was the class against me. And, it, you know, um, I would... I, I'd play a version of myself. I'd play like a hyped up character almost right. like, so every time they got a right card, I'd be like, Oh, I can't believe you got another right answer. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make you guys lose. Yeah. Um, or I, one time a child pointed out to me that hanging a man was actually kind of mean. So we started hanging <laughs> spiders instead. So it was even more ridiculous because there would be the body and then eight legs to go. Like the, the, kids, <laughs> the kids wouldn't miss that many the kids wouldn't miss that many. Right, yeah. They, they might only miss them. one per game. Yeah. So they would always get it right. Anyway, I had this one, I was this one trick pony teacher. I had this one game. Yeah. And I would have four kids in the group, or, you know, in those early years, I only had four kids in the group. And I kid you not, every single week, even the preteens and, and the young teenagers, like 13, 14, would come in and they would ask if we were going to play that game that day. Because every once oh, yeah. in a while, I wouldn't get all my educational objectives covered and we wouldn't do it. And right. those kids, every, those kids asked for, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, for years, yeah. weekly, if they could play that game. They loved playing that game as stupid as it was. Yeah. Um, this is something you can easily do online. Oh, Pull the whiteboard up. Make We've your, got them you know, all preloaded. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I would, I would either put a nonsense phrase there or I would put like a musical term, but most of the time right. I would just make the mo put the most nonsense phrases as the thing to guess. Like sometimes if I do it at the end of the class, the phrase would be get out of here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the kids would get it. I was like, okay guys, get out of here. I don't uh, want to see you anymore. Okay, bye. <laughs> yep, you know, like, and they were like, you know, they couldn't believe that the adult was being goofy anyway. Right. So, Something even as simple as that can build a lot of community amongst the students. Um, and I yeah. would see students, you know, I, I ran a pretty tight ship in terms of my group lessons, either online or in person. Um, if kids, when they were in practice mode, it was pretty quiet in that room. Mm. But when it came for game time, the kids would get, you know, they'd start talking to each other and, and, yeah. and it would build things and I wouldn't stop them. You know, it was a time to let loose a little bit out. You know, they've been in school all day and, and I right. wouldn't have fun in the thing. So I think that's a good way. Just even that very specific example of one dumb game that I just did over and over again. I thought, hey, the kids still like it. I guess I'm just going to keep riding this pony until it falls over. <laughs> and <laughs> it not. never did. It yep. never did. <laughs>
So anyway, that that's probably yeah. a little too much detail. So maybe we should move on. No, no, I think <laughs> that's, have something to add. that's that is exactly it. Is to it's do and I think you're actually alluding to a more important point that it is Ooh. that do what works for your teaching style too. Yeah. So like yeah. we were saying, don't overthink it, but also don't reinvent yourself. Like if you're not a game per- don't include games into your sure. teaching style. you know that's not gonna that's not gonna work for you if all of a sudden you're not only online and teaching groups but now you're implementing things you've never even done before in normal lessons and now you know that's where i think people were getting a little overwhelmed was the like mm. the stacking factor of this plus yeah. this plus this yeah um, but I, yeah i think you're dead on with that one um i think we have a couple questions left here uh what's yeah. the next one um, so this, um, I think we can, we sort of covered that one. Uh, this, I just sort of want to put a point to that is I, whenever the broadcaster one, where you're saying that, uh, parents hear like on the news, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. I'd, I'd just, I'd love to read some of those studies and see what it is they're actually quoting. Yes. I find yeah. that stuff very, cause I hear it a lot, but a lot of the time, like you said, if you poke a couple of holes in it, it usually falls apart pretty quickly. Yeah. And then if you back that up with just good messaging and marketing, it's like the one, two punch you, yeah. you punch holes in the, in the, uh, in, in the offense. And then you have some offense of your own. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's absolutely, you know, vital. Um, just kind of skipping, um, down a second to one of the, the questions. Um, cause I th- think this is these two sort of kind of go not quite hand in hand, but close. And I'd love to get your thought if, uh, hmm. Should you have a separate site for your online lessons, and how do you stand out online other when other people are competing in those? Um, hmm. I think we probably both go back and forth on this for a bit, but I'd huh. love to. This is sort of more of your how do you outface this side of your business? So how? Sure. Okay, so I want to teach group lessons. Okay, I've got this. I've got the materials. I've got the training. Now, how do I actually present? this as an option to my potential clients so i think well again i think there's some presuppositions here if you are entirely online Mm. then i think this question is probably moot for most teachers if they're entirely online if they're doing both online group lessons online one-on-one lessons in-person group in-person one-on-one my, I think the advice is pretty simple. I don't even know if I have much to elaborate on here, but I think it all stays on one site. Mm-hmm. And I think that you present it as its own unique program that you have created a thoughtful page for. So, mm-hmm. you know, you have your homepage, perhaps on your homepage, you have the various offerings that your studio has. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can click to learn more, both maybe on the homepage and in the menu. And my one recommendation would be don't don't lead with the online thing. Mm-hmm. I think that is what can cause some of those early anxieties in parents. I think you just mention the the strength of the program and and this is gen- this is advice I give not only for online lessons in general or online group lessons but and group lessons. I mean, it's all the same. You lead with the program and the results that the program provides for the client. Mm. The format doesn't matter. Um, so put your best foot forward. You, you know, and we have marketing trainings where we talk about how to create amazing lesson description pages and things of that nature. Um, I have formulas that I put teachers through, teachers who have never taken a a single minute of a course on persuasive writing. And within a week or two, they're writing really persuasively about their studio where they did not have that before. Mm. My point is, is that you lead with the strength of the program, the results it provides, you you don't reinvent the wheel, you have, you're using tried and true formulas. um, And if you're online only, I do think you have to say that it's online only. But mm-hmm. if you're offering an option for either, I think you just leave that out. And when you've actually connected with the person and, and begun an actual relationship with them because they've reached out to you, right. that's where that's where you can get into um, 
that's where you can get into which would you prefer you know mm -hmm. um now that's different if you're trying to kind of advertise nationally or internationally and that's a whole other ball of wax maybe we'll talk about that in a minute but if it is local um i think you give both options and then it's just what the market will provide if you want to get more online classes and you want to, or i'm sorry if you want to get more people into those online classes maybe you make a crazy good offer mm -hmm. to get them to go into you know maybe like a four to eight week starter course and then they go into ongoing lessons and the way if people are skeptical you say hey you know if you start in our in-person lessons um, it'll be this much but we actually have a deal or an offer going on right now if you take our four to eight week online class um, your child actually will learn just as much if not more because of a, B, C, D, E, F, G. Again, this is going back to being thoughtful right. beforehand. Um, and it's actually a really good um, beginner, you know, beginner class for kids. And then at that point, you have a choice as to whether you want to continue with online or if you want to do in person, get parents in that way, slightly undercharge for that class, make it, make it just a crazy good offer, but it's not like you're shooting yourself in the foot long-term because it's a defined period. It's a beginner class, you know? Right. The parents see that it works. They love the flexibility. They're not spending the gas money. And then you yeah. say, yeah, here's our ongoing online program. Um, you know, here's the cost. Do you want to go ahead and do that? Um, or, you know, we do have in person, but that's just not as convenient or flexible. It's up to you. Yeah. A lot of those parents will take the online because they now see it works. And yeah. you've brought them in on a crazy good deal. So they're already, they already have good feelings toward junior studio and they see the results. I mean, I, I just don't see how you lose with that formula. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's spot on. I, I, I'd say the only addition, and this is just sort of like a tiny little, like, I guess like self-promotion thing is one thing I've noticed uh, some teachers doing, and this has seemed to have been a positive effect is they'll actually put They'll have a, and I agree with everything you said, don't, you don't need a separate website, just have a separate page mm. in the website. It is for your online, especially um, if you're not only doing online, right? If you're doing both, have all the content in one place. Don't have people going to different websites. That'll get very confusing. Um, but um, yeah, I would say keeping everything uh, sort of bundled together is the best way to do it. So you can show those, those values um, to the parents. And like you said, once you've got the parents online, the, they've tried it, they'll like it, they'll probably move forward with it. One thing I was saying we've noticed teachers doing is actually on that, it, on that online lesson page, is actually talking a little bit about Musi mm. and how it impacts the quality and why. And we've, we, I actually even had a teacher who a piano teacher who was taking lessons, guitar lessons from me for a little while. And they had mentioned, they're like, um, I felt they're like, I find it very impressive and very professional that you have a dedicated portal for all of your online teaching, that there's like a, a, a space that is designed for us. And that, so we've seen teachers putting that kind of thing in their like sort of the cell to the parents is that we're not just using Zoom. We've actually thought this out. We're using something that's built for this. And that yeah. we've taken, like you're saying, you, you have to take that extra step to make it something more than just, oh, well, we also offer online lessons. Yes. It's like, well, no, it's actually, it's a whole nother core business in itself. It's not just a side thought. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if people treat it as its own core business, then they'll start seeing the results that they actually want. What you're doing right there, is really smart and um the show uh, mad men in the mm. pilot episode uh this is horrible but in the pilot uh, did i lose you there okay okay i think it glitched no, out yeah, for yeah. a second um um the advertising executives are trying to figure out uh how to advertise cigarettes when it has just come out from the Surgeon General that they could clearly, potentially yeah. be unhealthy. And they actually come up with a phrase to, to elicit a response in people. And so they say that the new tagline for this, you know, cigarette brand is it's toasted. And the idea that it's wholesome, that it, but what, what they're doing is they're actually focusing, they're actually focusing the potential 
customer, client, on a specific facet and, and saying, oh, that's how we're dealing with the problem that you're concerned about. Now, fortunately, yes. you can't get cancer from taking online right. lessons. <laughs> um, but It'll what help. you're doing, but, but what you're doing there by saying like, oh, actually, we actually have a platform that solves a lot of the problems that online lessons, um, you know, create. Good so, thoughts. you know, I'm not yeah. going to. I'm not gonna, you know, snow you here and say that there aren't some drawbacks, but we've actually addressed those by some proactive things we've done. And then you can kind of launch into the list of things like we do this, we have this feature, we keep things really organized. Kids actually have an easier time keeping track of their assignments because of the Musi platform. Like these are problems actually that in-person lessons cause that we've solved by being online and we proactively move. So you kind of, by having like a, a concept they can focus on, it's toasted or we use Musi. Um, yeah. Or in the case of group lessons, like, oh, yeah, some group lessons do that, but actually we use a, a, um, a format called successful group lessons that actually helps mm -hmm. kids move faster through their books than one on one lessons. Let me tell you how it works. This is a way yes. to kind of direct and focus the potential clients or current clients uh, attention mm -hmm. and and kind of address those things and kind of load their anxieties into a container and say, oh, we've dealt with it here inside this container. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's spot on. And and you're also um probably alleviating questions ahead of time. So like yes. the parents go on the website, read the information. When they come to you, now it's not so much of the why are the are these worth the money? Or you know, it's now more of like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Like what tell me more? What is this? Like, mm. how does this work? And one sort of tag on that that I just think is super important just to mention is that hybrid is is really the place I see that most studios are going to land is Interesting. that most studios are going to land in this place where they're they've if, especially if you're a brick and mortar if you physically own a location then of course if you're still paying for that location you're going to want to be back in person you know, doing your thing yeah. right yeah. but I think you'd be crazy to not at least offer your online lessons because it's sort of like, oh, why not? Like, why wouldn't you have that avenue available when it really, it takes no skin off your back to be able to, if anything, it's easier technically for a teacher just to sit at a laptop for an hour than it is to be moving around the classroom. So it's one of those where I see, regardless of whether or not online lessons is your thing, or it's the main focus of your business or, or, and group lessons is that, it's this is it's going to be a part it's just a part of what's going to be the new like i would expect to see more studios in the next five years offering all options online in person group and individual for both 100 percent. you know I just, here's the, the way oh go ahead go ahead no yeah just say i think that's the way it's going i'll say um this is kind of a funny way to end this i probably should have started this but my own son's taking online group lessons um, yeah, right. there you go. <laughs> he's taking piano from um, one of my business partners. Um, and in fact, honestly, I don't know why I haven't brought this up already, but we have a software that's coming out next year, year that um, is designed to make online group lessons even easier for music teachers. And I, I did a, awesome. I did a, yeah, I did a, um, I did an interview back with Greg four years ago and a lot of people found that interesting, but it, it really just wasn't ready yet at that time. And, 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 and now's the time, but my son is kind of using this system and this format. Um, it's a little more sophisticated than, than what I did in SGL. Um, but, uh, but yeah, th this is an, this is an easy thing for me to talk about and believe in because <laughs> right, you're, you're my own son is doing it, you know, yeah. um, and I see yeah. how well it works. So Anyway, Sam, I think that might be a good place to, to end. Yeah. Um, like I said, there's some other kind of general questions that people had about group that, that really, they weren't specifically about online. Um, they were really more just about group in general. So it could apply to online or in person. And like I said, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the post here, I'll have a link to a, a free resource that I've, or some free resources that I've created around um, around that topic and I think there's a lot of good information there someone could really go down the rabbit hole um, in terms of all the stuff we've put out over the years on that but um, hey thanks I know you're busy you're running a company yeah, the way you are awesome. um, th thanks for taking the time out and uh, we'll see where uh, when we 
can meet again to talk about Absolutely. some more stuff. Sounds good.